Welcome everybody to this ESC Spotlight Talk. We will start now. Uh, I am Pedro Llovera and the chair of the Working Party Static Electricity Industry of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. And it's my pleasure to introduce this uh, for us second Spotlight Talk. Uh, which is devoted for to electrostatic risk in industry. Um, I've been working on electrostatic properties of materials, diagnostic of industrial facilities for more than 20 years. And uh, I work at the Polytechnic University of Valencia and the Energy Technological Institute in Valencia, Spain. But I would like first to introduce Mr. Giorgio Veronesi, the president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering since January 2022. It's our an honor to introduce him and a pleasure to have him with us today. Uh, please, uh, Giorgio. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Petro, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Giorgio Veronesi, President of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. I've been in the board of uh, EFC for almost uh, seven years with two terms of, uh, as Executive uh, Vice President, and I covered this position since last January. I'm a chemical engineer by training, graduated in Padua, Italy. I've been spending the whole of my career in the engineering and construction business, involved in many projects all over the world with the several long assignments overseas. My experience is mainly project management, company management and commercial activities. I'm really very happy to be participating to this webinar on electrostatic risk in industry as adds due to electrostatic charges a very important aspect for industrial safety, which is the first priority aspect of plant design, construction and operation. Let me say something about the Spotlight Talk series. Uh, the EFC Spotlight Talks are a series of virtual talks on significant topics in chemical engineering. This is our third year of this initiative, which started in 2020 to keep together the community in spite of the restriction imposed by the COVID pandemic. The success of the previous years convinced the management of EFC to carry on and organize new series of spotlight talks, which now have become a regular part of our activities. Nine of our technical groups, working parties and sections, on food, mechanics of particulate solids, polymer reaction engineering, static electricity, loss prevention and safety promotion, process intensification, chemical reaction engineering, energy, thermodynamics and transport properties, are delivering during two weeks a short session of talks focused on specific topics by leading industrial and academic experts. I'm happy to report that based on the first feedbacks that we received, we had also the, for this November 22 series, a good attendance and a very good quality of delivery. The series also enables attendees to sample matters in areas of interest, but not attended before. In this way, we want to encourage cross fertilization between specialist areas. EFC promotes scientific collaboration, supports the work of chemical engineers in 30 European countries, representing more than 100,000 of them in Europe. And the EFC working parties and sections cover all major aspects of chemical engineering and are in fact at the core of the organization, forming the scientific engine that drives many of EFC activities. They provide an important forum for technical exchange and networking among the chemical engineers in Europe. Before concluding, I would like to thank all the people who work hard inside the working parties sections and the in EFC management team for this initiative to happen and to be successful. In particular, thanks to EFC Martin Pou in Toulouse, who did most of the work from the conceptual phase to the all organizational activities. So many, many thanks, Martin. And having said that, I would like to wish all the speakers and the attendees a fruitful and successful webinar, and then give back the floor to Professor Pedro Llovera, Chair of the Working Party on Static Electricity to start the works. Pedro, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Giorgio, for your nice introduction. Um, I, I also would like to thank EFC for, for the opportunity of for all of us of, of giving this webinar and of course to Martin for 
his tough work. And, and all of the people attending this webinar, uh, we are happy that it, to see that it attracts attention to many people. And we hope it will meet your expectation. One of the aims of this webinar for us as a working party is to build a scientific and technical, let's say, electrostatic community. So I strongly encourage you to participate with your questions during the, the webinar. Uh, uh, referring to that point, if you have any questions, you need to write the questions in, in the box uh, for questions and answers or to the chat. You can write them during the presentation. You don't have to wait at the end of any, every presentation. I would say it's better if you don't wait at the end because then I can write them and, and read them at the end of, of, the, of the presentation. Um, today, we will have three very interesting talks on electrostatic rig in industry. Uh, the schedule is the, the following. Um, but before, I would like to say a few words uh, about the activity of our working party. I, I will introduce each presenter for, at its uh, uh, talk. But, but now let me, let me say some words about electrostatic in industry. We, uh, we bring together industry and experts from, from uh, academia from many countries, even from outside Europe. And we try to promote the research activity and knowledge on electrostatic in industry. It, uh, it seems to be a, a very well-known topic, let's say a, a, a mature topic, but in the end it is present every day and it's not always well understood. When something happens because of the static electricity, uh, very often it seems like a mystery. And um, we always try to promote this uh, continuous learning and researching on electrostatics. Um, we have to say also that elect static electricity in industry has two phases, not only the, the worst one, which is safety, but also there are some applications. But today we will focus on, on risk. The first talk will present a large investigation on electrostatic incidents in during one decade. So it's a very important work for this for, for having this conscience about the importance of the of the topic. In the second talk, we will have a, a very detailed investigation of a particular incident. And the third talk, which is also a very particular situation, but that will show how, how this uh, new situation not handled by standards or papers needs some research, some measurement and some modeling. Um, in our Working party, we organize a conference every four years. Last one was in, in Wrocław, in Poland. It was a very nice conference. In, in fact, it was a 2021 conference reported to 2022. We published the proceedings of the conference now for more than 40 years at the Journal of Electrostatics. So it's a chance for, for having this diffusion. Uh, our next conference will be in 2025, even if it's only three years ago ahead from this one. But I will also want to say that there's another electrostatic conference, um, Electrostatic 2023, organized by IOP, the Directors and Electrostatic Group. We work very close with this group. We organize uh, the conference every two years. We promote each other. They also promote, for example, this, this webinar. And uh, it would be on 2023 at the Brunner University. You can contact Dr. Paul Hostock or, or see the webpage. Uh, I think there will be more information in, in very soon in the, the web page. Um, so now I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Francesco Restuccia, the King of King's College London. Francesco has um, covered the multidisciplinary research in thermal science, covering bioenergy, combust combustion, fire science, and heat transfer. He works in, also in lithium ion batteries, heat transfer research and focus on safety aspects, which is important for today, such as ignition prevention and improving overall thermal performance. He comes from Italy, and, but he studied at the University of Edinburgh, Caltech and Imperial College. He's also an honorary lecturer at Imperial, Imperial College London. He will present his uh, static electricity incident review for a decade. So please, uh, Francesco, it's, it's your turn. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Pedro. If if you click stop sharing, uh, it will then allow yeah. me to share my. Yeah. Yeah. No, I found it. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> stop. Share screen. Perfect. 
Perfect. Hopefully it's working. You can see my screens. Yes. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation today. Um, it's a very different audience to what I'm used to. Uh, as you said, I focus mainly on fire science and uh, static electricity is something I've done on the side. So um, this talk is on a, a 10 year review of incidents that we found in literature, and it was funded by the Research Foundation of the NFPA. Um, and the work was carried out by uh, undergraduate slash master student, who's now a PhD student here in computer science, who's an electrical engineer, was really interested in this area. So I want to start by saying this is not my field of expertise. I really enjoyed learning a lot, but most of you are much, much bigger experts than me in this area. This is a field I've only looked at in the past two years. Um, but my lab is the Heat and Fire Lab at King's College London. And again, we focus on thermal sciences. And just to say where we are, we're in the Department of Engineering at King's College London. Um, which is uh, in the center of London. Um, and just to pitch what we also work on mainly is battery fires, combustion, wildfire spread, ignition phenomena, and thermal management. So you see here some of the pictures from our papers recently. Okay, now I'll switch gears and move into the actual presentation. Um, I wanted to say that this project uh, ran over eight months um, with a project group from NFPA with a technical panel uh, which was made up of uh, people from uh, experts from the electrostatic uh, safety industry. So you have Paul Holstock, who you mentioned two slides ago, Mike Marando from the NFPA, Jeffrey Patton, Jim Reppermund, Kelly Robinson, Jeremy Smallwood, and Dave Swenson. And then the leads for this were Shreni Rangarnathan and Jacqueline Wilmot from the Fire Protection Research Foundation and the NFPA. Um, and I am presenting today, but again, the majority of the grunt work in getting all of the data and analyzing all of the data was done by Yona Sandu. And then together we wrote up the report. Um, so the report is this one, and uh, I'll have a link at the end of the presentation and all the data from it is public, including all the database with 100 plus incidents in it. Um, and so I'm going to give you some highlights from it today, but I won't go through 100 plus incidents. Okay, so just so we're all on the same page, Static electricity poses risks of fire ignition and human injury. Um, and the reason we started this project was despite that NFPA 77 exists, and it's an extensible, extensive technical resource, static electricity incidents continue to occur. And so the reason this project was proposed was that these incidents have resulted in the ignition of flammable atmospheres and human injury, including at least one fatality. And so identifying such incidents by type and technical information linked to each will help input any changes to the NFPA 77 code. So some of the members of our technical panel were uh, part of the working group working on possible changes to the NFPA 77 code. And so this report was to be used as a input in their discussions. So what we were very careful to do is we didn't want to make strong statements within the report. We just wanted to analyze the data and give some suggestions based on the trends we were seeing. Now, something I want to raise at the start is obviously we don't have all of the industry. We don't have all of the cases. Uh, we've done our best in six months to find as many cases as we could. Um, and so our project goal was to summarize, one, the provisions in existing codes that strive to prevent fires and explosions due to static electricity. Two, to summarize static electricity incidents reported in the public domain for that decade before we did the report, so 2010 to 2020. And then we again wanted to identify and evaluate the factors that contributed to that static electricity incident and identify existing gaps. Now, that's not always easy to do based on the information that we could find, but we did our best. We then provided a report to that was going to then be sent to the NFPA 77 Technical Committee. And the outputs from this project were an assessment of the current provisions in NFPA 77, some recommended practice on static electricity, and we try to identify in our conclusions some of the existing knowledge gaps. So again, I said I was very new to this area, so was my student. So the first thing we did is we tried to identify all the relevant standards that have to do with electro electrostatic, uh, static electricity incidents. And so, to identify the knowledge gaps that is missing in NFPA 77, we then looked at all the other standards that there are. So we studied first the NFPA 77 provisions, 
And then we investigated literature for other codes and standards. And in addition to the NFPA 77, we found all this long list. So ICTS 60079321 on explosive atmospheres, a second one on explosive atmospheres in IEC again, a CENELEC code, British standard codes, German standard codes, Japanese standards, um, and a couple of other NFPA standards. Um, so NFPA uh, 652, NFPA 654, and using the NFPA code finder, we identified also um, references in, uh, the, in other countries, for example, in Colombia or in Ecuador um, within their standards. So across the world, there are quite a lot of either technical standards or governmental standards based on um, the country that we could find. Now, one limitation is languages. Many, many of the incidents we could find were not always in English, so we did our best to translate them. Um, but again, the majority of the cases we looked at because of the panel composition were in English. Okay, so how did we gather data? We had various sources. So first and foremost, we read publicly available news stories. So again, as many languages as we could find that we could translate or use Google Translate for the ones we couldn't. And we looked through existing records on the internet. That gave us a picture, but again, it was very focused on a couple of countries. And so what we did is we also created a survey that was sent out to experts in the field of static electricity safety in industry, in consulting, and at various company. And that gave us 39 more entries from those contacts. And the survey, just to give you an idea, was closed in July 2021. So we had a few months of data gathering. We got 39 more entries. Now, the difficulty is that incidents have to be anonymized sometimes, and so the, uh, depending on the source. And so a lot of work went into deciding even what questions to ask so that we could get a data set made up of um, different uh, pieces of information that could be compared. And so what we did is, again, overall identified 89 cases, which we divided, we, we divided into 10 different identifiers that we were trying to find. Um, and the questions we asked were the following. So the incident location, the year of the incident, the incident type, the summary of the incident. So this was a bit of text explaining what was around the incident, what all other information was gathered, potential NFPA 77 technical item that was breached if it was known or if it was identified either by the party looking into the incident or if it was identified in the report or if we could identify, number of casualties, if any, and references or links. Um, and then in our database, we also added um, some conclusions from each case. So we added that manually ourselves. And if we could identify it, why the incident happened. And so we read every case, we compared to existing standards, and we tried to identify why they happened. Now, all of this table is public and uh, I have a link at the end of this talk um, if you're interested in all of the data. But I wanted to give you a summary of some of the data and a summary of some of the incidents. Now, again, as I said, I can't, I, for questions of time, I cannot give you all of them, but the majority of the locations of the incidents we gathered were from the US um, and the second most was the UK, third most China, some from Germany, some from Poland, Ireland, Spain, um, some from Canada, Mexico, Taiwan, India, Zimbabwe, and then a percentage of them were from unknown locations. So we had data from, let's say, somebody who filled in our survey that is a, you know, maybe a technical consultant in the area, but they could not provide us with the location because they would have identified the incident. And so the information of location or country was removed to make the event not identifiable. And so we have a percentage of them where we could not uh, link to a specific location. Everything else we gave the location. And so this is the breakdown. Okay, so the bit I think is most interesting for you is the results of these. And so in analyzing these incidents, we obtained um, some gaps and we have presented them. And so there were various reasons that resulted in these incidents. And over 20% of the cases studied identified negligence as the main reason. So that was the relative majority were negligence. For maintenance, inappropriate method of handling solids, powders, waste liquids, 
flammable liquids, inappropriate method of transport, inadequate bonding and grounding were identified as other reasons. And so this is the breakdown. So about over 22% um, of, sorry, 22% had negligence. Another 22%, again, need more advice from chapter 17 of the FPA. 19% were accidental, 14% poor maintenance and so on. Uh, break broken down based on the area and you'll find details of every single one in the report. Now I wanted to focus on the ones that have the higher percentage and give you some examples. And so again, this is just a breakdown. Um, but since I said negligence is the most common cause of fire ignitions identified, we wanted to see why this negligence was happening. And so throughout all the cases we looked at, the most common issues were Either the company or the workers were trying to save money, for example, all the way back to 1954. So again, not looking at the 10 years we reviewed, um, but even cases that we found that were historical, um, it was again, cost saving for the most part, or they had not reviewed and applied the protocols correctly. Um, so negligence was a pretty easy identifier in each case. It was either protocols were not identified or reviewed or cost saving was the majority of the reason. So then we looked at poor maintenance, which was the second highest. And so, for example, in 2010, we found an explosion that occurred at a PP uh, and copper clad laminate high-tech plant in Taiwan. So this plant contained the channel through the ground floor that went to the second and third floor. And the sophisticated instrumentation and the highly complex pipelines within the confined spaces, as well as the channel design, really enabled that fire compartment to be destroyed. And so the original fire outbreak occurred in the processing area on the ground floor, but it extended to the acetone storage tank, which was located on the third floor. So this was investigated and the investigation revealed that the acetone liquid leaked and dripped from the floor cracks and tunnel over to the PP processing area. So it wasn't actually in the area where the fire initially broke out, but it was due to poor maintenance of the floor and the tunnel. And due to the generated static electricity by this manufacturing process, the flammable liquids made contact with the source of ignition, which then caused the fire and a deflagration. And so sometimes the maintenance, which is the case I'm trying to show here, is not in the location where you typically would be uh, trying to be uh, putting in measures or control or preventative measures, but it can be in other areas and then flow down. So, sorry, the um, conclusion sort of for the poor maintenance was that improved electrostatic management can prevent the lost property of life and the liquid acetone liquid and loss of equipment caused by the static electricity fire. Sorry. So another area I wanted to focus on was the inappropriate method of handling solids, which again, we found quite a few cases on. And so one of the cases that we studied, the operator received an electric shock when he was transferring adipic acid from a rail car into super sacks. And so the initial installation was set up using an aluminum pipe, which was grounded, and the rest was made of spiral wound flexible hose. So then the aluminum section was moved to different locations inside the rail car, and the suction line was quite heavy, so it was replaced by a plastic line. So the plastic line was PVC, um, and the PVC pipe was being in an insulating plastic, so charges were generated on the pipe, and because the worker was not wearing gloves, he received an electric shock. So again, subsection 8.2 of NFPA 77 actually already offers clear information on preventing charge accumulation on personnel, including information on footwear, clothing, and gloves. Sorry. Minimum resistance to ground of 106 ohms is recommended to prevent shocks in the event of accidental exposure to mains electricity. So there is already something in place in the codes. Oops, sorry. In the codes um, to uh, avoid this. And yet uh, it was an inappropriate method of handling that solid that caused it. So if the worker had worn gloves, then that might have helped to prevent the shock. But if the resistance through the gloves is too low, you might still feel the shock. 
Also, shock might also be felt if the electrostatic voltage available for discharge is greater than the breakdown voltage of the gloves. Nevertheless, the main hazard in the situation was very much a highly energetic propagating brush discharge created by the inappropriate use of PVC pipes. And subsections 10.1 and 10.2 talk about metal piping systems and non-conductive pipes, respectively. Section 10.3 warns about the hazards a static electricity charge generation while using flexible hosing and tubing. So all these handling situations are well covered in NFPA 77, giving you lots of text here, I'm sorry, but it was just to show that there are many different sections which cover these type of incidents. And so they're already in the existing codes. Again, inappropriate method of handling waste liquids. Uh, here's the case from 2003 in the US. So this is again before the 2010 window that we were looking at, but the release of hydrocarbon vapor during an unloading process of basic cement and water from two vacuum trucks. So it resulted in two employees being killed and three with serious burns. And the root causes were that the shipper failed to identify the flammability hazard of basic sediment and water, and they failed to communicate the hazard both to the employees and the contractors. And so again, NFPA 77 already offers guidance for loading tank vehicles in section, section, subsection 12.2 and in 12.2.5 and in 12.3. Last area I wanted to show was inappropriate methods of handling substances and powders. And so again, if you pour a flaked product into an agitator vessel, that can be dangerous unless you follow proper protocol. There have been incidents where that has caused a static electricity incident. So we found uh, one of the cases, for example, is uh, 120 P bags with organic flakes uh, flakes being fed into a 10 meter millimeter cube stainless steel agitator and a jet flame shot out of the mouth of the vessel. Shutout valves had been tested prior to the incident and no leakage had been found, but when they were tested at a much lower pressure, a leakage was found. And so while pouring the product into the vessel, ethylene oxide was moving up the sloping sides of the product. When the opening at the top was reached, a combustible hybrid atmosphere was created, which was ignited by brush discharges from the PE bags. And it had been concluded that the tightness and pressure test should be differentiated. Again, here I just write down some of the codes that are already there um, in NFPA 77 for this method. So give you some examples of different areas quite quickly on, on purpose, because what I wanted to do was identify really the gaps that we found. So again, most of the common reasons when incident happened are either poor management or negligence. We found some surprising data regarding the need for more guidance in NFPA 77, Chapter 17, in fact, 24% of the incidents we analyzed were due to, could have been avoided if uh, more guidance in Chapter 17, we believe, was included. And so examples of such incidents were related to ignition in a solvent coater. So in NFPA 77, uh, Chapter Subsection 17.4.2 warns you about the potential result in a static ignition hazard if flammable coatings are used, that advises the use of an electrostatic neutralizer. But even so, Industries would like to receive more guidance on how to proceed when using coaters to limit the appearance of static sparks. Another finding or another gap we found is that the lack of preventative maintenance or detection of when an electrostatic control measure fails can cause undetected conditions of risk. So we think further attention should be given to ensuring that the key control measures, such as grounding of equipment, are checked and properly working. And then two more gaps we found is, we think having a repository where cases can be added in an anonymized fashion can be beneficial for the future to see if changes to NFPA 77 bring changes in practice, in incident types, and to be able to have more information on events in an anonymized fashion, which helps protect confidentiality and industry information. We put this in because our technical panel found it really, really useful to actually have a full table with different incidents and different types and it is difficult to obtain some of this information, but we think that it is beneficial to have some setup where this information is being gathered and um, analyzed. We also analyzed um, a few technical items that were breached for each incident and studied, and we found that these primarily involved subsection 8, 10, and 11, 14, 15, and 17 of the standard. We found that uh, subsection 17 does not contain extensive information on prevention of static ignition and solvent. So we, re we recommend that chapter 17 be extended to give clear instructions on how to prevent ignition from static spark and solvent coaters. 
So our conclusions is we made three suggestions. First one is on the need for more education around NFPA 77. Many of the cases analyzed occurred not because of lack of guidance, but rather a lack of awareness of the guidance or inappropriate application of the guidance. And so we think more work is needed to spread awareness about NFPA 77. The second main suggestion of our report was the expansion of chapter 17 in NFPA 77 or subsection 17 to include more guidance on how to proceed when using coders to limit the appearance of static sparks. And the final suggestion is the creation of a live database of incidents in the model of the one used in this report, for example, um, to gather information on future incidents and to be able to analyze if education around NFPA 77 decreases incidents in specific categories. Now, the report is about 30 pages plus over 100 pages of data, and you can find the report publicly available on the NFPA website, and the link is here below. This talk is recorded, so you'll be able to find it again. Um, and if you wanted to download the entire data set, again, I told you we have for each incident sort of 10 columns, um, and we categorize it. You can get it through this link in Zenodo, which is also in the report, um, and again, it's publicly available. You can see that I just took a screenshot this morning, and there were 101 downloads, so we hope they found it useful. And that's it. I wanted to make sure I left at least five minutes for question. I think I have six minutes. So um, I hope you found it useful and happy to take any questions. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's a very impressive work and, and that brings a lot of information. There are two questions. There are two questions. One from Harald Wilms. Maybe you can read it, but I will read it. Did you also come across examples polyethylene powder creating some sort of brush discharge when being filled into silos exceeding a certain diameter. What would be your proposal to deal with this problem? I am interested to discuss this issue or maybe even later. I, I think he refers to the to the following presentation or maybe after the, the, the um, talk. You thank you, Harold. Questions? Interesting question. So off the top of my head, I cannot remember um, certain diameters. However, if you look in the database, you can do it by type of incident. So you can look at powders um, and then it will give you the entire list of the ones we found on powder. And not it didn't. the problem is not every incident, we could get as much information of others. So for example, in some, we could get diameters. So I gave you an example in one of the slides on the diameter of the pipe and the, and the height. But in other cases, we didn't have all of the, um, all of the cases. Um, Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, the other question from Alexander below is the minimum resistance I cited is 10 to the power of six ohms, sorry, not 10 to the six ohm. When I put the number yeah. in the slide, the <laughs> exponent didn't, it went down. Thank you very much, Alexander. <laughs> yeah. So maybe the question about side load and dia diameter, this is uh, uh, that there's a relation between diameter and the risk of the explosion, but maybe uh, Anders will say something later. Yeah. Is there anything there's more questions? Have time for more questions if, if not at the end. But uh, if not, while people are asking one question. Have, from Max Papajewski, have there been any reports or other incidents about methanol due to electrostatic charge? Um, I do not remember out of any of the ones we looked at, I do not remember any from methanol. I remember acetylene. Yeah, I do not remember any from methanol off the top of my head. Okay. But again, there might be, it's just, it might not be in the hundred that we found. Well, that, that point what you were talking about, this uh, this uh, collection of cases that people could check, because I'm, I'm watching that uh, everybody has a specific cases, and maybe this list of incidents we propose could be very, very great. Yeah, I think, I mean, I personally think, you know, this area, for example, was new to me, but everyone else on the technical panel has worked in this field many, many years. And they they have said that, you know, it would be useful if we have something more widespread um, because it's it's it, it sometimes is very difficult to find information. And if we know what that information is, if we, especially if we, if we make changes and we see how those changes have affected things. And so if... NFPA 77 gets updated, and I believe it was in discussion to update it in the last year, um, then it would be beneficial to see if future incidents have improved or if the specific type of incident that had been flagged before is not happening anymore or still is. Um, yeah. 
Mbokwe. Yeah, from Kelly Robinson. Ah, yes, he, he thanks you and Joanna for your work. Good. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for the support. <laughs> and now, Thomas Sherpa, do you see a difference between the US and EU regarding the application of the Red and the Standard? Since NSPA 77 is actually a recommended practice, should versus shall language? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> Very good question. I don't have an answer. I've asked this actually myself to the panel um, because I noticed that it's recommended um, and there are, um, yeah, some European ones that are not recommended, but it's shall. Um, I don't know if the number of difference of incidents we find is due to just the people that receive their survey versus the country that they happen in, because you saw a big chunk were in the US, but I think it just might be that a lot of the people who ended up filling out our survey do a lot of um, uh, incident investigations in the US. Good. And so I don't have an answer to that. That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you say that, like, I have one question, who, who performed the expertise? It's always the same company, do you know? It's external experts? They were all different. They were all different. So we sent it to about, oof, I wanna say about 20 different uh, people and then we asked them to send it out as well if they could find other people um, and so we basically I asked our technical panel for as many contacts as they could think of and then I sent it out to those contacts and I asked them to send it out further if they could. Um, did, did you notice a, a lack of electrostatic experts in companies or, um, or not it's difficult to say with it. difficult to say because for example compared to other fields i work in like self-heating ignition then there's probably more than self-heating ignition but compared to i don't know battery thermal management there's way less right and so even within my own research field i noticed that on different topics some industries have way more experts depending on the type of jobs there are at the moment so at the moment with all the electrification of vehicles it's very easy for me to find thermal management not so easy mm -hmm. to find ignition for example within a company uh, yeah. yeah, this is the problem of training. So we have one more minute. If not, taking if there's any more questions, you can still think about questions, and I will let some time at the end of, of the the talks if someone has questions that be could be answered later. So, and thank you very much for the opportunity yeah. to present again, Pedro. So thank you for your nice work and for your for your presentation. Now I will, if there are no more questions, I will go through the next speaker. Let me share my screen to introduce him. Okay. The next talk is about uh, a case. So now we had a, a general view of some cases, um, but now we have the, the chance of having an expert who participated in, a, in, a, in an expertise of, a, of, a, of an explosion in a silo, so maybe that can answer the, the previous question. It's uh, Anders Thuling from Anders Thuling Consulting. He, uh, his company works since 1920, providing expert advice to chemical industry with, within the fields of fire safety and electrostatic discharge, and uh, in investigation and analysis, technical advice and development of preventive strategies for the coal, pharmaceutical and food industry, as well as petrochemical refineries and many other industrial areas. He also provides a very important training uh, service for all categories of personnel working in areas where explosion risk due to static electricity are a critical issue. So, unless you can go through your presentation, I will stop sharing my screen. It's your turn. What should happen now? <laughs> That's the pressure on you. <laughs> Shall I share a screen now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can share your screen now. The screen where you where you have your PowerPoint. <laughs> and now we're back. Yeah, the same. Share. Yeah. Good. It correct. It works. Is this the first slide? Yes. Good. Thank you very much, Pedro, for your presentation. Um, 
I am to try to explain uh, accidents that occurred handling sulfur dust. And the reason for the ignitions was definitely electrostatic discharges. <clears throat> Doesn't change picture. There we are. Well, I have had a presentation. I'm a chemical engineer. I have worked half my life, can you say, in paint industries. And the last factory where I was a plant manager, they had an explosion in 1981, and two people were killed at that explosion. <clears throat> I started my own company in 1919, and the primary thing was to try to explain for people working with flammables well, how they shall handle the risks from electrostatics. Uh, I've also worked quite a lot with um, audits and to make accident investigations, etc. Um, nowadays I'm retired, but I still do uh, a little bit of work now and then. My agenda, uh, what kind of discharges are around um, and what may these discharges ignite? It's different for different discharges. Uh, what happened at Söder Energy? Uh, well, I'll try to explain that. And how dangerous is sulfur dust? That's another thing I would like to dig into. And what can be done to reduce these risks? And a conclusion, of course. We have a few different uh, kinds of discharges from electrostatic phenomena. Uh, one quite well known is corona discharge. It's usually regarded as harmless, but it is not always. We have something called brush discharges. Cone discharges will be of major interest in this presentation. Spark discharges are well known for most people, I guess. And then there is propagating brush discharges. There is a difference in these discharges power to ignite things. And this can be put together in a table like this. If you first uh, look at the three, the five different kinds of discharges, you then have three columns uh, depending on the kind of materials present. If you have gases and fumes, it's usually very low ignition energies needed to ignite them. If it comes to dust, it is usually a little bit higher ignition power needed, like from three to 10 millijoules, which is quite common. But we also have dust with higher ignition energies needed. And if you look in these columns, you see that uh, cone discharges can ignite um, fumes and gases, and of course, easily ignited dust, but not highly ignitable dust. It's unlikely, as you see there. Spark discharges and propagating uh, brush discharges may ignite all of these substances. Um, this is the plant where they had these uh, ignitions. It's called Söder Energy, and it's uh, south of Stockholm. It's a fairly big plant where they burn um, um, wood chips mainly, and a little bit other things. They produce a lot of uh, heat energy and quite a lot of electric energy also. Why do they add sulfur? Well, they found out that they had deposits on the boiler tubes. So uh, someone told them that if you add a little bit sulfur, you reduce the risk of depositions on the piping. 
<clears throat> as you see here, the fuel is wood chips, scrap materials, papers, etc. Well, what happened here? Sorry. They had a dust explosion. Well, something is not very nice to me. Back again. Excuse me. Maybe maybe you press several times and now it's reacting late. No, it is. Here we are. See? Um this company installed a silo to handle these sulfur uh, granules. And uh, they filled it from a tank car, truck, um, pneumatically. They blow the sulfur from, um, from the ground floor up to about, I think it was 20 meters or something like that, and then filled it into this silo. And um, all by a sudden there was an explosion and it was released by an explosion vent. But it turned out that this explosion vent was too narrow and too long. And the expert, consultant expert, I wouldn't mention who, he said that it must be something wrong with the earthing grounding of the piping from the tank connection, tank car connection up to the silo. Uh, despite the fact that it was made from entirely metal, there was an explosion. So what was done, there was a lot of earthing cables connected, as you can see in this picture, top, and they changed the explosion vent channel. Well, Sad to say, in January 2014, there was a second explosion while filling this silo again. Now the explosion vent worked better, but it still caused a lot of damages to the building structure. And um, something was not happening that should have not happened, or rather, <laughs> We know that pneumatic transportation generates a lot of electrostatic charges. If at least one of the materials uh, that have contact is insulative, has high electric resistance, there will be an electrostatic charging. Doesn't matter if the piping is made from metal, still the sulfur will get charged. Well, what's so special about sulfur dust? Sulfur is an element that is very insulative. And if you handle granules like this, about one millimeter size or a little bit more, you will always get a fine dust when you handle it pneumatically. And this dust, fine particle dust will have very low ignition energy, about one millijoule, minimum ignition energy. Uh, what did I look into when I made this investigation? Um, all equipment uh, was earthed and bonded together. The filter bags used were anti-static as they call them, and uh, they have good dissipation properties. 
Now it's uh, a little bit interesting because you don't have to use anti-static bags when you uh, only have dust. If you have dust and solvent gases or other gases, then you should use anti-static bags. But with only dust, it's not needed. But one in, uh, important thing is that these filter bag cages, metal structures that are holding the filter bags in position, shall be earthed. And we have seen accidents where this was not the case. But in this case, it was well earthed and um, connected to earth. Uh, the interior paint in the silo was also controlled and it had breakdown voltage below four kilovolt. I mean, it meant that it was sort of porous, allowing a charge from the sulfur dust to dissipate to earth via the walls of the silo. Uh, at first, I was very puzzled about this, but I uh, have been in um, contact with Dr. Martin Glor for many years, and I know he was making data simulations of different uh, ignitions and charging phenomena. And he made a simulation and he found out that this must or may have been a cone discharge. And what is a cone discharge then? Well, when you charge these granules that are around one millimeter in size, uh, they uh, get a very high charge density on this heap of sulfur. Sulfur uh, on this, in this silo. What he did many years ago when he discovered this phenomena, he placed a camera, an old time camera, with an open shutter in the top of a silo. And then when they fill this silo with some insulative powder, they discovered afterwards when uh, developing this photo that was made um, in total darkness, that there was a long, a lot of long strikes of light. You can see in this round um, picture, there are luminous lights going from the middle of the uh, silo out to the uh, outer shell of the silo that is made from metal. So when you charge powder heavily, you get a creeping discharges from the surface of the cone in the silo. And these creeping discharges may ignite easily ignitable dust. The density of this uh, sulfur granules is about 1200 kilos per cubic meter. The diameter of the silo was only 2.4 meters. It was 13 meters high. And um, when before the filling started, it was only about 10 minutes, 10% left of the sulfur. And it was uh, more than a month since the last filling of the silo. Uh, the explosion all occurred already after filling about 600 kilos of sulfur granules. And the dielectric constant about permittivity is about two for this material. So he calculated that the charge to mass rate was 10 to the six columns per kilo uh, which is a rather low value for pneumatic transfer. Sorry. Um, sulfur coating in pipings. Sulfur when you uh, transport it pneumatically, will center on the inside of the piping. You will get a highly insulative coating sort of on the inside of the piping. Uh, 
but it's important that the coating uh, will not be able to create propagating brush discharges. Propagating brush discharges occurs when you have a uh, earthed tubing piping like this, and then you have an insulative uh, coating on the inside of it. When you have high charge densities, you may get these propagating brush discharges, but they are not likely to happen when the coating is very porous. I mean, this sulfur dust layer or sinter is permittive, permittive to electrostatic discharging during this pneumatic transfer. So I excluded propagating brush discharges uh, quite soon in this case. Well, we discussed this a lot and Martin Glower recommended inerting. That means that we remove oxygen, so we will be below 10% ox oxygen in the flow of the pneumatic transportation. This is quite difficult to achieve without very extensive investigations in the plant. You can increase the conductivity of these granules by adding antistatic agent, ASA. Uh, I don't think this was discussed very much with the supplier. The supplier was a Polish company of the granules. Another way was to reduce the free chargeable surface within the silo. That could, for example, be done by hanging wires from the top of the silo down to the bottom. And that should be required to be quite a lot of wires with, for, for example, half a meter of distance in between each of them. Or reduce charging by very slow transportation or use FIBCs, that is big bag or flexible intermediate bulk containers instead. Finally, a summary. Pneumatic transport will generate high charges. This is very well known. And sulfur is easily charged as it's very insulative. Uh, it's known that fine dust is created whenever you transport uh, granules with pneumatic transportation. Uh, it's assumed that the cone discharge over the sulfur cone in the silo was the reason the ignition happened twice. And the measures to prevent this, these accidents was in this case to go over to big bug or FIBC handling instead of going using the, uh, the uh, silo. Well, any questions? You can learn more if you look into www.csp.gov. They have a lot of very interesting uh, examples of accidents that has happened. Some of them are due to electrostatic discharges. And you can also join the Dust Safety Academy, which gives a lot of examples of dust explosions, fires, etc. Well, thank you very much, all of you. I nowadays work for a company called X Solutions. And you can get in touch with me, with me via this mail address or telephone. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Anders. Thank you for your nice presentation. Very clear and very detailed. This is, I think that's very good for, for the audience. Uh, we have one question from Harald Wilms, maybe two questions because the previous one, but the last he, he wrote was, have you tried dense phase conveying with the sulfur granules? Dense phase conveying with, I think to avoid the 
fast conveying. Do you mean conveying with other means than pneumatic transportation? It saves them space, maybe. Can, can you detail it more, Harold, please? If not, he, he previously asked for the, for the information about broad discharge where the silos exceed, exceed a certain diameter. Um, I think that was one of the solutions proposed, no, if I'm not wrong. This silo was not very big in diameter, as you uh, may remember. And uh, I think if you had a larger silo, the risk would be greater. But uh, as insulative as um, sulfur is, it, it, it is a big risk to charge this material too much. And uh, if you convey it with conveyors or other things, I think you could also reduce the risk of um, high charging. But it was impractical when you had built a silo in this way and everything was dimensioned for pneumatic transportation. Okay, so, so uh, Harald is, is uh, clarifying the question. Vance phase is slow motion at high pressure. Have you tried this dense phase conveying? Yeah. Sorry. Beg your pardon? Yeah, yeah, so go on, go on. The, uh, have you understand the, the question? He, Harald asked if you tried dense phase conveying, and he says that dense phase is slow motion at high pressure. Do you think they tried this? I'm not sure I understand the question quite, but uh, I, I uh, realized that slow um, handling is one good way of reducing the charging of the sulfur and all materials. I mean, we have this kind of problem when you hand polypropylene and many insulative uh, plastic granules, etc. So we move to another question. Maybe you can write by email to him, Harold. Uh, Jean-Luc Revel, he asks, what should be the preferred practice to implement to operate this type of sulfur silo? What is the best solution for you? Well, as uh, Martin Glower suggested, inerting is one way of doing it. Uh, another way is not to naturally to move material slowly, like with a scoop elevator, chain elevator, or something like that. Um, another way is to use these wires. If you have wires hanging from the top of the silo down to the bottom, uh, they will uh, be able to dissipate the charge from the sulfur cone in mm. a better way. I mean, it will be shorter ways to earth than out to the silo walls. Yeah. But you have to make sure that these wires hanging will not be broken, deteriorated or worn down so they break because then they will be uh, spark plugs instead. Yeah, this, this, uh, this way, is, uh, this um, thing you say to, to, to hang, it, it's a way also to reduce the effective diameter no, of the silo. Yes. yes. This. Okay. Yes. Kelly Robinson asks if sulfur absorbs water. Will increasing the moisture content of the sulfur pellets lower charging? So using humidity to control static charge? Yes, of course, water could um, reduce or increase the conductivity of the sulfur. But I'm afraid uh, the risk of building a big <laughs> porridge inside the silo would be uh, not a very pleasant idea. Uh, adding water is uh, sometimes not too attractive. Then it's better to use an anti-static uh, agent, I think. But that should have been done in the factory where they produce this material. Okay. There's a, one question from Timothy Bell, which who also comes again with a dense phase, phase conveying. He says a dense phase conveying uses much lower conveying velocity 
than the uh, dilute phase. What does this do to static charging? So again, the space. It sounds like it could reduce the charging, definitely. Mm -hmm. So you think it, it could help? Okay, another question is Ben Grant Jones. This was the same. Was increasing relative humidity into the silo during transfer considered? So again, increasing relative humidity in the silo. This was not considered? Rebuilding the silo um, would be too costly. And really, I think the idea of instead using uh, flexible intermediate bulk containers, FIBCs, uh, is a quite a good solution and a good uh, economic alternative to using the silo. But this is instead of rebuilding the silo, just don't using the silo and use the containers. That's yeah. Changing. Okay. Okay. So okay, so it's easier to change to to this container instead of trying to find any cost costly solution to the silo. No. So, yeah, that was the conclusion of Söder Energy. <laughs> okay. Can I see more questions? I have one, one question, which is a very general one. Um, why are, have you, after many years of expertise in electrostatic, do you have a, a mature or proved methodology for incident investigation? Or do you just go and try to find by some, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I use my uh, and electrostatic glasses when I look, <laughs> look into the. Now, of course, you have uh, several ways of looking into accident investigations, and um, um, I try not to complicate things. When I need support, I take support. Martin Law, for example, is a very yeah. good partner. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a lot of uh, exchange with a couple of Lütgens for many years in Germany, and. It's very good to have colleagues around. If you have colleagues, use them, talk to them, ask them. <laughs> That's a very good methodology. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I cannot see more questions at the moment. Maybe at the end we can have one new question for you. I have not the Jeremy Small question to Francesco. We will read it at the end. So again, if, if someone writes a question now when the presentation is finished we, we can handle that at the end of the, of the talk so uh thank you thank you Anders. very nice presentation very very good example of investigation and um, we will move now to the to the next presentation next presenter is alexis pay you can just share my screen for the presentation Easy for me. Yeah. So the the I can no not yet. Yes. Am I sharing my screen? Normally yes. I hope so. Um, so Alex is going to present charging powder in vessels with flammable vapor atmospheres, risk measurements and modeling. So it's a combination of of two different materials. Um, flammable vapors and, and powders. It's a quite complicated question. Dr. Alexis Pei is uh, the Global Safety, Health and Enver Environment and Process Safety Manager at STAL since 2017. So it's a very large responsibility. He works on process safety since 2004 in many companies, with Institute of Safety and Security, Q, and he has published many papers in exostatic. He's MSc in chemical engineering and PhD also in chemical engineering at the Universitat Ramon Llull in Spain. And he has also a business science diploma at the University of Alta of Catalonia, which is also sometimes important to have this vision in the work of an engineer. So Alexis, uh, your turn, you can start your presentation. I will stop sharing now. Thank you, Thank you Pedro. We'll share my screen now. Okay. You see the screen? Good, good, we can see it. Very nice. Okay, good. So in, in this case, I I also present a work that we developed together with, with Martin Lohr 
as uh, support for expert uh, questions. Um, it's, a, it's a project that we are still running at STAL because we charge powders into vessels which have flammable vapor atmospheres. So it's a well-known hazard um, that this type of operation generates electrostatic hazards. So I will first present you the operation. So we charge powders through the manhole with a metal grid to avoid that the box falls in and also we'll see later to limit the distance uh, at which the babe the, the back can go into the the, the mixer um, then we also have uh, the liquid which is being stirred and we see that sometimes there is a powder layer formed on top of the liquid when the charge of the powder is done too fast during the whole charging we have an exhaust uh, active with suction uh, bringing the vapors and the, that, the dust that is catched to a filter. What we know is that all powders are insulating and the contents of the vessel are, are aromatic organics, alcohols and ketones for instance. And of course the, it's obvious that in these conditions we have no inertization. And in, also in some facilities, inertization could not be introduced because vessels don't have tight covers, etc. As well, uh, we see in some back the label of risk of electrostatic discharge or not to use the back in presence of flammable vapor and gas atmospheres. So it, it is obvious that there's a clear coincidence of the potential of a flammable atmosphere and an electrostatic ignition source. So the way that we assess this situation is by a systematic uh, methodology, which I present next. In first place, we need to identify where the charge is generated. Secondly, where can it be accumulated? And third, once accumulated, what type of these charges can it trigger? So in terms of charge separation, it is obvious that during the powder transfer from the back to the vessel, but also steering low conductivity liquids, and especially if they contain powders, will generate charges. I mean, all the, all the movement of the dust, the back, and the steering of the liquid will generate electrostatic charge. Secondly, the charge can accumulate only in two places, as always. First, in conductive and non-earth elements. Secondly, in non-conductive materials meaning low conductivity liquids and mixtures included. So not only solid materials, but also liquid materials. And third, the type of relevant discharges that we are facing here are spark and brass discharges. Corona discharges are not relevant, not because they are not produced, but because they don't have the capacity to ignite the atmospheres present. Secondly, um, propagating brass discharges cannot take place also because we have no insulating um, surfaces in contact with um, metal earth surfaces or conductive earth surfaces. All the reactor walls are stainless steel. We have no enameled or glass line reactors. And the powder density and the layers that we can form um, are porous and will not generate this type of propagating brush uh, situation. And finally, co cone discharges, as we saw in the, in the previous presentation, are not considered because we are not forming a cone, because during the charging, the dust is being stirred as well. So in, it, it, there's movement on top of the liquid. So we see no cone. No, there, no cone can be produced in this condition. So the current safety principles are avoid discharges by uh, operational conditions and avoid presence of um, vapors near the manhole. We'll repeat that later. It's a key um, safety measure. What we aimed with this project is to assess some remaining risk. Uh, assessing the hazards in depth and also following this systematic approach. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we considered were sparks from equipment. 
the hazard in this case are non-conductive earth parts and we considered of course um, big equipment is earth but also there are and that is that was not new it was already there bonding of pipes and valve to ensure equipotential in all um, conductive equipment also in rotating and moving parts the steerer we checked that it was well earthed which was the case so that the steerer was not insulated from the other part of the equipment we also have a metal to metal contact on the metal grid in the manhole so you see in the picture that there are no rubber or plastics or anything insulating it's just metal to metal contact in several points so it's well earthed uh, the floor is metallic and people are um, wearing anti-static shoes so this is how we sorry avoid um, sparks from equipment then we also consider discharges from liquids and at this point i don't uh, speak about sparks because in our case some mixtures could be um, had some um, low conductivity liquids like toluene or shailene so in this case the the key factor is the balance between the charge generation and the charge dissipation under continuous steered conditions and this is something that is um, uh, quite simply addressed in the IEC 679.32.1, but also in the NFPA 77, which was mentioned in the first presentation. So in those electro, uh, reference guidances for electrostatic hazards, when we speak about a transfer, you have a, a source and a target vessel, and then you transfer from the source to the target. But in this case, we have a continuous steering which is a different situation. It's not just charging the liquid or the dust. It's then once in, it's continuously stirred and that can generate charges. So what are the conditional modifiers if we use a LOPA uh, nomenclature to, to assess this situation? First of all, the path to earth of uh, charges on the liquid and the path to earth is evident. They are in contact with the steerer and the walls and they are metallic and earth. So charges can be dissipated through these uh, contacts. But also the liquid conductivity. If the liquid conductivity is high, then the charge generation will be much lower. If the liquid conductivity is low, then the charge generation can be much higher. And also the presence of powder. Uh, it's, it's a powder does not get diluted. It's a dispersion. So we have a two phase. It's not how, how homogeneous liquid and we need to check that so we did some tests on this so as you can see uh, in terms of measures safety measures the stainless steel vessel uh, has no coating on the walls so there is a direct contact to earth zero volts is the potential on the vessel of the wall on the wall vessel all low conductivity liquids were a couple of years back already doped with anti-static additives so we decided that we will not use any more uh, toluene or shailene without any anti-static additive. Many times these substances were mixed with other substances like uh, methyl ethyl ketone or which have a high conductivity but we decided we don't want to start uh, to start calculating and measuring all the substance all the mixtures of liquids we have to ensure that they are all highly conductive. We will only use highly conductive liquids here. So we we have this this measure already introduced. And because of this, all mixtures have a high conductivity. The test that we did on the liquid were, uh, were on the field, and we measured electrical field above the liquid. And that was performed with an induction field meter. Um, of course, we also measured that there was no flammable uh, atmosphere in the area where we placed the field meter because of, uh, we know that this is flammable and flammable vapors will be inside. But as I said before, and that was also um, helpful to verify that the air through the manhole, which was going in, was avoiding the buildup of a flammable atmosphere close to the manhole. You see the, we measure the field on top of the liquid before and after adding the powder. And we 
um, we um, confirmed that no significant field was on top of the liquid. So when mixers have a high conductivity, no significant uh, electrostatic charge buildup was identified with or without powder. So the takeaway, at least in this point, is that high conductive liquids effectively avoid hazardous charge buildup on mixtures, even at a high uh, steering speed and with powders inside. No brush discharge from low conductive mixtures are expected because we'll have them. Also no spark discharges from high conductive mixtures because they are in contact with earth. Now, these charges from powders. The potential of uh, the potential discharges from powders, we thought they could come from dust clouds. And it's very difficult to assess uh, the density and the charge of a dust cloud. But as you can see in the picture, and also thank you to the, to the ventilation being active during the charge, we never saw a dense dust cloud inside the vessel. So you see it's kind of foggy, but you can see the stirrer. And there's a thumb rule saying that um, you really need to have a dust explosive uh, concentration. You really need to have a very thick uh, density so you could not see through the cloud. And in this case, we could see the stirrer, even the, the wall at the back. <clears throat> the second point are the dust layers. Dust layers. Uh, during the, the, the powder charging are formed. You can see the, them in the picture. Below this layer, which is moving slowly, there is the liquid. So the dust, if we charge it too fast, changes a layer and slowly gets into the liquid. And um, this, the hazards of layers were not addressed. How dangerous are they? They are identified in some papers, but layers are not addressed neither in the NFPA 77 nor in the IEC 679-32-1. So we could not really take any reference to assess how hazardous is the situation. Um, in first place, the cloud were visually assessed, as we already mentioned. The concentration was never high enough. So we consider that it was not relevant. Also, the, the particles that we have here are very small. So the electrostatic charge that this uh, airborne dust can have is also very limited. Not cannot generate a hazardous uh, discharge. In terms of layers, we assessed and uh, the thickness we thought it could be from centimeters to tenth of centimeters, and they could uh, represent a relevant potential to generate a brass discharge from the top of the of the layer not a propagating brush, as we said, but or a cone discharge, but a brush discharge from this highly charged insulating layer. Um, we also investigated discharge during the powder dosing. We used for this uh, purpose uh, a closed loop coaxial antenna, which was placed inside the vessel. And you can see this uh, black wire is the antenna we use to uh, detect the, the discharges. You see this is the background noise and uh, the signal registered is millivolt and you see the time. And this is the, the signal during the dust charging. So <clears throat> we think that the signal uh, is cost are, is identifying brass discharges. However, the energy or position cannot be quantified. As well, we think that the signals can come from the dust being charged into the vessel, but also from the movement of the back um, in case if it's plastic or contains some uh, insulating plastic. So there are brass discharges during the dust transfer, and that is clear. And brass discharges, we know that they are hazardous, they are effective to ignite uh, flammable vapors. You see also here some um, the, the, the dust layer. We measure the field also above this dust layer with an induction uh, field meter. 
and we saw that when powder layers are present, the, the field was higher, the electrical field was high. So the, the depth or how thick is this layer is a, is a function of how we introduce the dust and how it goes into the liquid, but it's a critical safety parameter to avoid a hazardous situation. So currently, <clears throat> the, the avoidance of powders is by organizational measures and introducing technical measures to basically control the speed or the, the, the mass rate of uh, addition. Also, a, a bit in detail on discharges from the bags, because bags are clearly one of the most uh, clear um, sources of brass discharges when they are especially plastic. We measure the surface resistance inside and outside of the bags that we use. And for plastic bags, the results were above 2, 10, high 11 ohm in and out. In paper layers, they were always uh, below 1, high 9 ohm in and out. And in paper with plastic layer in between, uh, they were below 1 to high 8, eight in and out. So the takeaway was that layer paper or paper and plastic bags were permitted in zone one. However, plastic bags are not permitted in the classified area of any type, not even zone zero, zone one, zone two. So, and the key principle here is to have this air input on the manhole to avoid vapor concentrations above hazardous levels. And then uh, use what we call the exclusion principle to accept hazards. And I will, in the next slide, I will explain you what is the exclusion principle. The next step possible could be to introduce uh, a new technology to avoid presence of bugs in the vessel atmosphere. What is the, the exclusion principle? Uh, the, we, we know that in ATEC, the zone is classified regardless of the operation phase. Even when this uh, vessel is empty, or full of water with absolutely no flammable liquid or dust is still a zone uh, zero and a zone two around the manhole. So what we use is the to accept this, this risk currently of having sometimes bugs in this area is exclusion principle. And you see here that we what the exclusion principle introduces a second uh, consideration in the assessment of ignition hazards because we cannot play around with a zone classification. So what we considered is the presence of these ignition sources. So in this case, we say that the ignition source is present under normal conditions because we know that it's there. It, there, there are brass discharges, we measure them, but the coincidence is excluded either in a reliable or highly reliable way. It means, okay, there it is a classified area, because at some point we have a flammable atmosphere there, but we exclude the simultaneous presence of this atmosphere and ignition sources. When we have the atmosphere, we don't have the ignition source, which is, for instance, when the manhole is closed, the atmosphere is there, but there is no ignition source. When we have the ignition source, because the manhole is open, then with this airstream, we ensure that the ignitions, the, the atmosphere is not flammable at that point. So we also performed, uh, as in the case of the silo presented before, some model calculations. We, first of all, we measure the charge to mass ratio by, uh, and you see in the picture that this ram is uh, insulated from the earth with a plastic layer. The resistance was um, above 20 giga ohm, so it was well insulated. And we put some powder in to measure the amount of charge that we get. We measured the voltage with the field meter on the drum. The capacitance of the drum was also measured with the capacitance meter. And the amount of powder introduced was measured with a, with a, with a scale by weight difference. So we obtained this uh, 0.2 uh, 10 height minus 6 coulomb per kilogram. 
and then we perform the calculations to understand the phenomena of these layers. And we model the electrical field and electrical potential. So the conclusions were that electrostatic hazards were really uh, systematically identified and assessed, that measures uh, were defined to avoid discharges from equipment and substances, and that the residual risk linked to bugs and zone classification currently is addressed with these operational principles and having this airflow. But we are considering also uh, introduce a different technology to dose the powders into the vessel. However, sometimes uh, this is not easy. And secondly, we want to make sure that we don't introduce uh, additional hazards because of the change of technology. Um, avoidance of powder layers is also important and could also be addressed with this technology. And no inert conditions were identified as mandatory. So that's that's it. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexi. Very, very, very nice presentation. And we have some questions. OK. We have one question from Max Papajewski uh, regarding the conductivity of liquids. Is there a threshold that defines or separates high from low conductivity for liquids? Yes, yes, I will. It's it's defined in the IEC. Um, I think it's it's worth. I mean, we 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 are in. It's an EFCE talk, and we are in Europe. So I will just I will just show you the. Um, let, let let me share the screen again. This is the, the, the norm that we are referring. The IEC technical specification 679-32-1. And here in, uh, in static electricity in liquids, the first thing that, uh, or one of the things you can see is high conductivity, medium and low. 10,000 picosiemens per meter, and this is the uh, relative permittivity. If you don't have it, take two. In my, in, in in our case, we use this simplified. So we consider low when it's below 100, medium between 100 and 10,000, and high conductive above 10,000. And uh, the anti-static additive really have this limit because they ensure with this ppm you reach 10,000 picosiemens per meter uh, liquid conductivity. Okay. Very, very precise answer. Um, I see there is one question from Martin Fuchs. Maybe she can she can uh, do it with the microphone. Or if not, I can I can read it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've got a question. Did you study the influence of the mixing? That means that impolar model and operating conditions because we uh, influence the the liquid surface. Mm, will influence the and I mean the, yeah the the um these impellers are blade impellers are not anchor impellers because we need a high turbulence uh in the liquid however the the, the liquid is high is also in some cases highly viscose so what what happens is that even if you have really impellers um to produce a lot of turbulence in inside on the on the top layer is is the same phenomena as a, a limit limit condition or a limit layer when you have a if you, even if you have a high turbulent flow in a pipe in fluid dynamics you know that you have this uh this uh, really uh, not turbulent layer very close to the wall and that is what happens on the surface so it's it's in our view it's it's really the worst case condition for the impeller because we have those impellers really to, to create the highest turbulence and they are uh, running really fast. So we don't think that even if we increase the speed of the impeller that the charge generation will increase because the, the results from the field meter were very low 
so we then judge the the impeller shape or or steering speed as a as a critical parameter So regarding the, the mixing process, there is also a question from Kelly Robinson. He say, uh, thank you, he thank you for the very fine presentation. And his question relates to steering. He says, I understand that good steering makes the liquid circulate vertically from bottom to top rather yes, than in, yes. circle, in circles. Would this yeah. proper liquid circulation help suppress formation of powder layer on top of the liquid? So sorry um, about my steering. <laughs> Yeah, I agree, um, Kelly. <clears throat> it's exactly what the impellers make. The impellers have uh, this uh, type of, of um, turbulence or circulation, but the top of the layer or the top of the liquid on the surface slowly goes into into the direction of the axis. We have a small vortex in some in some cases, um, but it is even not enough if we charge the, the dust very fast to avoid the formation of this. Also because when we charge the dust, sometimes it falls close to the wall. The maximum point of turbulence is close to the axis of the impeller because of the circulation in this sense. But uh, yeah, uh, I agree. And, and that is what the impellers, but it's not even enough. Okay. I mean, we also consider changing the technology uh, like, um, kind of um, recirculating the liquid over the vessel and introducing the dust by venturi effect on the on the on the pipe where the liquid recirculates but of course this requires a major change in the facility so it's not discarded it's one of the technologies that that we are assessing to introduce the the, the liquid uh, sorry the dust or the powder into the liquid for recirculating in a pipe because of this venturi effect and there are technologies there you can find uh, them in the internet to to introduce dust in in liquids in this way the the wetting of the powder then would be much faster and of course you would avoid the the dust layer on top because the liquid would be already dispersed in the liquid when it flows back to the vessel but in terms of viscosity and some other uh, limitations it's not a uh, it turned out not to be a very easy solution we have two more questions. One from Max Papajewski. Uh, regarding discharge from powders, would it have to wet the powder with the reaction solvent before yes. adding it to prevent discharge while adding powder to the reactor? Yes, that 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 would help, but then we need to mix this 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 kindness of, of uh to generate this kind of paste. We, we need to do that somewhere else and then transfer it uh, to the reactor. Yes, it could it could, it could help, but um, but you have measured you have not tried in your measurements. Yeah, exactly. Another question from Gabriele Caspani. There are new studies on the modeling of charge generation scenario. What is the current state? How can we model the generation? The generation? uh well we at least in our case we don't have new studies we just have the studies that i presented um the what we saw at least uh, that was a uh, this type of electrostatic simulation started a few years ago and because of the capacity of some software packages to perform these calculations and um, in terms of modeling, it has the same limitations on all models. Uh, the variables and the values that you put into the calculation and the limit conditions will define the output of the calculation. So you, you need to be very careful in, in the values that you choose. So to model the generation, what we did was in first place, um, calculate the charge to mass ratio that we were introducing with the dust with the weight scale and the and the few meter that we that I have shown you and secondly we measure the field on top of the um, liquid to see if it would match uh, fairly or reason in a reasonable way with uh, the fields that you would expect and in both cases the the answer was uh, positive so 
Okay. Yeah. So it, what you can model depends very much on the on the variables that you know, and the better you determine the variables, the input variables to the model, the more accurate and the more reliable the output will be. I, I see this very specific case has many questions. We have two more questions. Uh, Thomas Sherpa. Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. I, I can read it. The situation you presented is highly dependent on adequate exhaust ventilation to avoid formation of flammable atmospheres, particularly in the open loading shot. Shoot. Yeah. What an instrumentation provided to ensure adequate exhaust flow? Yes, of, of course, we, we, we divide the, we also had the debate on, okay, if this is our main or critical safety measure, we need to ensure that ventilation is there. So what happens if the operator forgets to open the valve or switch on the ventilation? So, uh, and this is something that can happen. People make mistakes. We, 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 even if we thought, okay, without ventilation, when you charge the dust, you will notice that the dust is not being sucked in because uh, without ventilation, the dust is very light and it will not just go in. So you will see that there's something wrong. But even then, we decided to have an interlock between the manhole and the, and the, and the ventilation and also an alarm in the plant in case that the fan stops by a problem in the fan. So we have an alarm there saying, okay, you have the fan is stopped, you have no ventilation. So there is an interlock in the manhole and an alarm in the fan condition. Okay. Very good question. Then. There's a, a comment from Kelly Robinson uh, related to liquid conductivity. It's not really a question. In one investigation of an ignition in a crystallization process, we found on, that the antistatic agent neptan was removed by the crystallization process. So it is important to measure the liquid conductivity after mixing to detect this scavenging of the antistatic agent. So nice, yeah. Yeah, nice. thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, to be fair, we, we, we consider also the, the antistatic uh, addition as a secondary or as a second layer in terms of avoiding insulating uh, mixtures. Because uh, Tolwin and Shailin are in are now in any case the 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 solvent in the highest concentration. Most of the time we have uh, ketones, methylethyl ketone or alcohols, IPA, which are highly conductive, and we measure to start the conductivity of the worst mixtures um, or the mixtures with the highest Tolwin and and Shailin. Uh, concentration and they were all above the 10,000 picosiemens per meter. But even then, we said, okay, we, we want to have this antistatic toluene and, and shellene, so that's why why what we what we introduce. But but you're right, we, we are well uh, well aware of the scavenging. Also, if you have you can have this in in, in plastic bags or uh, antistatic uh, agent in in some solid materials. Yeah. Okay, there's one last question from uh, Anonymous, it's no, no name. <laughs> uh, regarding modeling, I'm looking to model chart development in a non-conductive liquid impact. I have not managed to find example for the surface source terms. Did you have any suggestions? It's a very technical question. Uh, not, not on the spot. If you want, you can send me a, an email. Um, I'm not not on the spot. I cannot answer. I will just okay. I will take the moment to, to share my screen with the contact information of every yeah every participant. Those are the presenters' email if you if you need it. Um, and don't we don't forget one question to Francesco, which was a previous question from um, from uh, Jeremy Smallwood. Try to find it. Sorry, I answered it uh, in writing. <laughs> How'd you write it? You read the yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay. it was that his question was the incidents due to negligence. Did I think they were due to lack of awareness or risks, or due to ignoring risks? I think it's a mix. Some were very clearly cost cutting, while others were not having reviewed or applied the protocols properly. Good. Oh, good. So I see there are a lot of questions. Okay. 
So thank you, thank you very much. I think we can finish now the discussion. Just a last look to any new questions. No, I don't see in the chat neither. Oh, very, very nice presentation. And I was very happy to see that uh, the audience react a lot uh, with many very interesting questions. Uh, here you have the presenter's email if you need further information. Um, I would just uh, close the session with a, uh, because I received information from during the, the talk from the, the other electrostatic conference I spoke about and the IOP conference, sorry. Let me just show the information. Um, it's in Brunel. The, I, I put some wrong information in, in the contact information, so I, I, I now show this last slide. From 4 to 7 September, Brunel University is a very large university in the London area. And um, they will have a Bill Bright Memorial Lecture by Professor Bala, Bala, Bala Chandran about the recent advances in the application of non-thermal plasma to medicine, dentistry, to environment, in agriculture. And uh, those are the, the topics. The important information is that abstract submission deadline is 28th April 2023. Um, we have a lot of topics. And um, for any inquiry, that's the good contact information. It's uh, Jenny Griffiths, the Institute of Physics. So that uh, is the good last information. So that's all from for me. Um, ah, yeah, I guess I have another last, another last, uh, sorry, another last slide I don't want to miss. I think it's important. It's this one from the next, um, next polite talk. Uh, I have a notice, I don't know if Ma Martin, you can, I took this information, you can check if it's correct, but those are the topics of you know, next, uh, um, the public talk on safety and risk, sustainability transition, electrification of chemical process, sustainability, machine learning, and so on. That you can find, if it's not correct, you can find the, the correct information on the FC webpage. So that, that's Petra. all. Petra, yeah, I yeah. would like also to take the opportunity yeah, to sorry. remind everybody okay. that we will have the European uh, Congress of Chemical Engineering next year in September okay. in Berlin. Sorry. the most important event every two years and it's the first time we are holding this event in person after Florence in 2019 because of COVID so it's uh, something not to be missed so thank you sorry thank you for this very very important information so now I think we can close the webinar uh, yes no more comments no so thank you all of you for, for your participation of the presenters and of course the EFC for, for organizing this uh, for like talk. And I hope you can, we can meet on new webinars in the future and the conference next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very well thank you, done. Thank you. Thank very you. nice. Thank you. Bye-bye.